Christine Jessup was a nine-year-old girl from Queensville, Ontario, who disappeared on October 3, 1984, after getting off the school bus. She was last seen at a nearby corner store, buying a piece of gum. Three months later, her body was found in a remote field, 56 kilometers away from her home. She had been raped and stabbed to death. For more than three decades, the mystery of who killed Christine Jessup haunted her family, her community, and the nation. The case became a notorious example of miscarried justice when Guy Paul Morin, a neighbor of the Jessops, was wrongfully convicted of the crime and spent 10 years in prison before being exonerated by DNA evidence. But the real killer remained unknown until 2020, when a breakthrough in forensic genealogy led the police to identify him as Calvin Hoover, a Toronto man who had died by suicide in 2015. Hoover was an acquaintance of the Jessup family and had no previous criminal record. How did the police solve this cold case after so many years? How did they miss Hoover as a suspect for so long? And how did the Jessup family cope with the tragedy, the injustice and the revelation? Queensville was a small and quiet town in the 1980s where everyone knew each other and where children could roam freely and safely. Christine Jessup was one of those children a bright and cheerful girl who loved animals, music, and baseball. She lived in a farmhouse with her parents, Bob and Janet, and her older brother, Kenny. Christine was last seen alive on October 3, 1984, a Wednesday afternoon. She had just received a recorder in music class and was eager to show it to her mother, who had gone to Toronto for the day. Her father was in jail for fraud and her brother was at a friend's house. She went home, found no one there, and decided to go to the corner store to buy a piece of gum. She also planned to meet her friend Leslie at the park across the street, but Christine never made it to the park. She vanished without a trace, leaving behind her red bicycle, her jacket and her recorder. Her mother and brother came home shortly after and realized she was missing. They searched the neighborhood and called the police. The police launched a massive search for Christine, involving hundreds of officers, volunteers, dogs and helicopters. They canvassed the area, interviewed witnesses and followed leads. They issued an amber alert and distributed flyers with Christine's photo and description. They appealed to the public for any information or tips, but the search yielded no results. There was no sign of Christine or of her abductor. There was no ransom demand, no confession, no clue. The case quickly became a national sensation and a source of frustration and fear. The nightmare continued for three months until December 31, 1984, when a farmer in Sunderland, Ontario, discovered a decomposed body in his field. It was Christine Jessup. She had been raped and stabbed multiple times. She had been dead for weeks, if not months. The police confirmed her identity through dental records and notified her family. They also collected DNA samples from her underwear, hoping to find a match with her killer. But the technology at the time was not advanced enough to produce a reliable result. The murder of Christine Jessup sparked outrage and grief across Canada. It also sparked a desperate and flawed investigation that led to the arrest and conviction of an innocent man. His name was Guy Paul Morin, a 24-year-old musician who lived next door to the Jessops. Morin was an eccentric and introverted person who played the clarinet, collected insects and wore colorful clothes. He was also a friend of the Jessop family who had helped them with chores and had played with Christine and Kenny. The police suspected Morin of being the killer, based on circumstantial evidence, such as his odd behavior, his inconsistent statements, and his resemblance to a composite sketch. They also relied on dubious witnesses, such as a jailhouse informant, a hypnotized neighbor, and a psychic. They ignored or dismissed other leads, such as a blue car seen near the crime scene, or a bloody glove found near the body. Morin was tried twice for the murder of Christine Jessup, the first trial in 1986 ended in a hung jury. The second trial in 1992 ended in a guilty verdict. Morin was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. But Morin maintained his innocence and appealed his conviction. He was supported by his family, his lawyers and his advocates who exposed the flaws and errors in the investigation and the prosecution. They also pushed for a new DNA test using more sophisticated techniques. In 1995, 
the DNA test proved that Morin was not the source of the semen found in Christine's underwear. He was exonerated and released from prison after spending 10 years behind bars. Moran's exoneration was a historic moment and a turning point in the Canadian justice system. It led to the creation of the Commission on Proceedings involving Guy Paul Morin, which examined the causes and consequences of the wrongful conviction. It also led to the establishment of the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted, which later became Innocence Canada, a non-profit organization that helps other innocent people who have been convicted of crimes they did not commit. But Morin's exoneration also raised a haunting question. If he was not the killer of Christine Jessup, then who was? The case of Christine Jessup remained unsolved for 25 years until 2020, when a breakthrough in forensic genealogy led the police to identify the killer as Calvin Hoover, a Toronto man who had died by suicide in 2015. Hoover was an acquaintance of the Jessup family who had worked with Bob Jessup and had visited their home. He had a wife and two children and no criminal record. He had never been a suspect or a person of interest in the investigation. The police identified Hoover by using a new investigative technique called genetic genealogy, which involves uploading DNA profiles to genealogical databases and finding relatives of the unknown person. The police then used traditional genealogy methods, such as family trees and records, to narrow down the list of potential matches and to verify the identity of the person. Hoover was the source of the semen found in Christine's underwear. He was the killer of Christine Jessup. The police announced the identification of Hoover in October 2020, 36 years after the murder. They also apologized to the Jessup family and to Morin for the mistakes and delays in the investigation. They said they did not know the motive or the circumstances of the crime and that they could not charge or question Hoover since he was dead. The identification of Hoover was a shocking and unexpected twist that brought closure and relief to some and anger and disbelief to others. It also raised new questions, such as how Hoover managed to evade detection for so long and what his relationship with the Jessup family was. The Jessup family said they were grateful for the resolution of the case, but also saddened and disturbed by the identity of the killer. They said they did not know Hoover well and that they had no reason to suspect him. They said they hoped he had suffered in his life and that he would face justice in the afterlife. They also said they missed Christine and that they wished she was still alive. They said they remembered her as a happy and beautiful girl who had a bright future ahead of her. They said they loved her and that they hoped she was at peace.